fellow investors, and welcome to another episode of Ritter on Real Estate. We teach you how to passively invest like a pro. I'm your host, Kent Ritter, and today my guest is Yannick Cujo Virgil. He's the principal of Merlin Acquisitions, which is a Baltimore-based real estate investment syndication firm. His experience in commercial real estate began as an asset manager, where he was managing uh, managing portfolios for private equity firms with over $1.5 billion in assets under management. He oversaw multi multidisciplinary portfolios consisting of multifamily mixed-use office retail and industrial. He's got a whole mix of experience there. So Yannick, thanks so much for being here today. Thank you so much for having me, Kent. I'm really excited to uh, be on the show. Yeah, man. And, uh, you know, like we always start from the top, you know, tell folks a little bit more about who you are and how you got to where you are today. Absolutely. So again, my name is Yannick Cucho Virgil. I am based in uh, Baltimore, Maryland. And my background is a little bit different. Um, got into real estate, I would say 2017, 2018, after retiring uh, from the NFL uh, through a knee injury, unfortunately. And, um, you know, my career in the NFL was pretty short, but fortunately, um, I was one of the lucky ones to find um, a transition into real estate. And um, it's one of those things in the professional space that's talked about pretty frequently because that the transition from being in the professional sports realm or just athletics in general to, you know, a regular professional career is pretty tough because mm. when you start off, you know, in athletics, everyone knows you as, you know, this guy that does really good in sports, right? You're the highlight, you're on ESPN. And then, you know, transitioning out of that, when the game ends, you kind of lose an identity. And so for me, fortunately, I was able to latch on rich dad, poor dad, latch on a rich dad, poor dad. And that led me into real estate. And here I am today as a full-time uh, syndicator. That's awesome. I, I mean, I think that's a pretty fascinating story. I mean, even just that the lead up to, to making it into, into the NFL, I mean, it's not something that many people can do. So, I mean, congratulations on, on, on being there. I think, first of all, obviously it shows your hard work and dedication. Uh, I'm curious about, so I'm curious about some of that because I'm sure you learned a lot through that process of just, I mean, coming up through athletics and being a high performance athlete. Um, talk a little bit about the mindset that, that you had to develop and how, and then how, how is that translated into making you a successful real estate investor as well? Yeah, absolutely. So my, my background, just, just for context and my sporting, um, you know, background, um, I walked on division one. Um, you know, I wasn't the biggest, uh, the fastest guy on the field. Um, you know, didn't necessarily have all the measurables, but one thing that I did have was the work ethic. And I think whether it's sports business to be successful, you know, or in life in general, you have to have that foundational work ethic, you know, being able to outwork anyone that's in front of you. And essentially that is the same model that I use to get to the NFL because, you know, at the NFL level, <laughs> every, everyone is good, mm -hmm. right? But the ones that are separated between the good and the great are the ones who actually have, you know, the work ethic, who can um, eat right, who can uh, study film, do all the necessary, necessary things to be great. Um, but, you know, unfortunately in my case, I had a career ending knee injury that, you know, knocked me out my first year of the mm -hmm. NFL. But um, from a mindset perspective, you know, that was something that I was able to carry into the real estate space because I didn't have any finance degrees or business degrees. I thought, honestly, Kent, that I was going to play in the NFL for 10 years, retire, and then go own a gym, right? I, yeah. I did kinesiology at the University of Maryland. Gotcha. Um, and so in order for me to get in the asset management space, in order for me to level up, so to speak, in the real estate space, it just came down to straight hustle, networking, and just, you know, selling people on your true character and what you can do for them. Yeah, I mean, that's got to be a difficult transition. I mean, coming from 
I mean, just it's hard to get into private equity in general, right? But but not having that finance background, I mean, definitely having a, a unique background, right? How were how were I'm curious how you were able to tell us a little bit more how you were able to work your way in and how you were kind of, I mean, one, I think it's just that believe in yourself and you can do it, right? And that that's that mindset that you brought. But how were you able to to put yourself in such a great position to really learn from some of the best in the business? Absolutely. I think for me, it was really focusing on getting educated and whether it's, you know, CCIM, which is one of the, the institutional kind of courses for commercial real estate, whether it's just picking up every single thing that had to do with commercial real estate, because I knew that I, at some, you know, to some degree, I had a disadvantage from just not having a finance background, right? I applied mm -hmm. at different um, institutions and companies, and I got declined because I didn't have any experience in finance. Um, but for me, I knew that I had to take that opportunity once I had an interview. So um, for me, my, I first got my start in commercial real estate from being a broker, right? Uh, working for KW Commercial, doing multifamily investment sales and office and retail tenant rep. And that allowed me to get some sort of resume in the real estate space, right? So I had to pay for it. Mm -hmm. And then from there, networking, I met this uh, principal for this firm in DC. And um, he was looking for an asset manager at that time, I told him, you know, my aspirations and what I wanted to do with my career, and where I wanted to go. And um, somehow, <laughs> I got him to sit down with me just for some coffee, and it turned into a job interview, and I was able to um, sell him, so to speak, on hiring me based off of, you know, my work ethic, my willingness to do whatever it takes to get educated and get up to speed in the asset management space. So I think sometimes in life, you know, you may have some disadvantages here. Everyone starts at different, um, let's say laps in life or different starting measures. But the way that you close the gap is by just hustling every single day, doing whatever you can and just being resourceful with what you have to be successful. Yeah, I, I think that's a really powerful message because, I mean, it's been my my same experience in life, obviously not playing professional sports, but just in general that it's it's the success is not about being the smartest person in the room or the most gifted person in the room. It is work ethic. It's all about work ethic. And those are the people that, that always separate themselves. I mean, whether it's I mean, really, I, I, th I think in any career, right, that that reigns true. And I think that people get too caught up into, oh, I'm not smart enough, or I'm not this, and I'm not that. It's like, it doesn't matter if you're willing to put in the work and do the grind. I, I think anybody can make it. And that's one thing I love about real estate is like, you know, there's anybody can be successful in real estate. It's all just about how hard you're willing to work, you know, and, and I think that that's great. I think you got a good story. I mean, I think you're proving that out. Yeah, absolutely. I, I think, you know, that's, that's one of the things that I knew that I was going to be successful in real estate because of my background in sports, because for me, I've always been in a leadership position of leading a team, right? In real estate, you have to lead a team. You have to know how to deal with adversity. I can't tell you how many times, <laughs> Kent, that, you know, on the football field or whether it's off the football field that we had to deal with some sort of adversity mm -hmm. and um, just being able to just, you know, handle the nonstop grind of real estate at times, especially when you're starting off, right? Yeah. When everything is on you, when you're wearing all the hats in your company and you're just, just trying to, you know, take those small stabs at success and moving forward to grow your business incrementally. So I knew that I was going to be successful in real estate, but everyone just needs an opportunity. 100%. So how did you, or I'm, I guess I'm curious in why actually you chose to go the large kind of institutional route, right? Private equity route versus just versus going out and, and buying, you know, some, some properties on your own. I, I feel like a lot of people take that different path to kind of start maybe like single duplexes and things, and then kind of, kind of graduate, you know, to multifamily over time, you took a different path. I'm curious on your thought process on that. Yeah, absolutely. So, so actually I did. So a little bit about that. So I actually did do some start off doing some single family investing flips, okay. you know, wholesaling yeah. to start off. But the thing about commercial real estate is that 
you really have to be educated in finance, understanding markets, the whole nine to be successful in that space. And that, that takes time, right? You know, someone can wake up tomorrow and go buy a property, but can they wake up tomorrow and buy a hundred unit building? Probably not. I mean, mm -hmm. if they do, they would probably be making a ton of mistakes, right? So for me, I wanted to make sure, especially when it came down to raising capital, I wanted to make sure that I was proficient enough in the commercial real estate space before I put my money on the line or even worse, someone else's money on the line to go and buy, you know, syndicate multifamily, right? Yeah. Um, because it's in the reality of this game is that um, it requires, like I said, a lot of education, a lot of knowledge, expertise to execute these transactions. And so what better way to learn commercial real estate by learning on someone else's dime, right? It sounds, it's, it doesn't sound too good, you know, at, at, a, at a glance, but that is the best way for you or someone that's trying to get into the world of commercial real estate is to learn from someone else, whether it's working for one, working for someone or learning from a mentor, because now you're able to visually see, um, you know, some of the mistakes that they've made so that you don't go out there and make, make the same mistakes, right? It's like, for me, it's like watching film in sports, right? Yep. You watch, you know, the best person on the, on the team or you watch the best person on the team that you're playing against, but can you analyze the film and take that into your own game to be successful, but then also avoid some of the same mistakes that that person made as well? So it was a perfect opportunity for me to learn the game, learn by earning, and translating that into, you know, our company today. Yeah, I mean, I, I think it's a great path. We really share a similar path in that way. And then I, you know, I took a stint working for one of my mentors at their private, at his private equity firm, um, really doing much the same thing with, with the same mindset uh, around, you know, you're going to you go in and provide value, but also learn a ton, right. And build connections and see, see how the groups that have been really successful have done it. So I, I mean, I think it's a fantastic path to get there. And I'm sure you, I'm sure you learned a ton being there. That's kind of what I want to dig into now, or what are some of those things that you learned or some of those things that you, you said, you know, I don't, I don't want to do, and, I, and I'm going to do that differently in, in my business. So I'm curious, like, what is it looking at, um, you know, looking at a large institution, what do you see that like they do differently that some of uh, maybe the smaller guys don't, don't do as well. Absolutely. So I think the biggest thing that I've learned within my asset management career, uh, working for, you know, institutional retail private equity firms is that the successful ones have those systems and processes lined up in their asset management operations. And there's a lot of education out there in the specifically in the multifamily syndication space that's solely focused on just acquisitions, but mm -hmm. asset management, as you probably already know, Kent, is where you make the money in real estate, right? We can go out there and raise money. We can go out there and close a deal, but can you operate, right? Can you handle adversity? Can you handle, you know, when tenants <laughs> don't pay rent, can you manage delinquencies, right? And yeah. so um, being able to have systems and processes to handle all of the operational items that would lead towards your success in real estate or specifically real estate asset management and operations is something that I've learned a ton on. So whether it's, um, you know, focusing on KPIs, whether it's um, handling delinquencies, whether it's managing construction, um, all of the things that actually contribute to making money in real estate after you close the deal is something that I've been able to take into my own syndication practice and implement, you know, some of those things, but also tweak it to things that I think would work well for our firm as well. Right. So um, mm -hmm. asset management is really where you make your money in real estate. Yeah, I a hundred percent agree. And it was funny. I was just having a conversation with somebody else about that same fact around there's so much content related to how to buy an apartment. And so little content related to how to actually run an apartment. And that really is, like you said, the most critical piece, right? It, it's, it's delivering on all those promises you made up front, right? And realizing that business plan. So 
what what are some of the the key things in i mean you mentioned a few metrics and things that you know you would track and pay attention to but like maybe walk us through like what what's your asset management rhythm look like so if you're you've got a property you're managing a property i mean how are you staying in touch and, and on the pulse of what's going on and making sure that you know everything is being done the way it needs to be done absolutely i think the biggest thing with with asset management specifically is just focusing a lot of their time on just KPIs, right? Because those KPIs have some sort of direct correlation as to how the performer would actually play out, right? And as you probably already know, I've never had a deal that went 100% in line with performer, right? But our goal That's is right. to make sure that we get to it as closely as possible. So whether it's, you know, um, having metrics that allow us to evaluate revenue growth, expense growth, you know, delinquencies. One of the things that's really important is turnover time, right? We're in the value add real estate space, being able to turn over those units exactly or some, somewhat close to how you modeled it in your pro forma is really important, especially when we talk about um, supply chain disruptions in the industry today. I mean, getting materials, all of those items yep. that contribute to turning over those units, yep. you know, let's say in a 30 day period, and then you, you know, you maybe model the 30 day lease up, you know, that time period is extremely important to track, right? Because some of those things, you know, you may be able to find, you know, some some missing links that, you know, you can identify within your asset management rhythm to help you actually get on track, or if you're falling off a track, um, to get on track as well, right? Mm -hmm. um, you know, so some those are some of the things that are, I think, are extremely important, specifically in the asset management space. And, and how we do it is we utilize, um, you know, systems and VAs to track that as well, right? And our property management um, company, not our company, but our third party property manager also has, you know, VAs to help us track some of those metrics as well. Um, because that's, that's what, you know, we're in the business of, right? It's just delivering on expectations that we uh, said that we're going to do uh, for our investors, right? And if we don't, then essentially we've somewhat to somewhat degree failed, right? So um, that is something that is crucial in the asset management space is definitely having those set of KPIs, having those spreadsheets out there that can be tedious sometimes, um, but it's required for us to actually do our jobs in the asset management space. Yeah, I appreciate that that info. And so when you're working with your property manager, and you said you because you, you guys are using third party management, it sounds, how do you hold? How often are you talking with the property manager? How are you holding the property manager accountable? Like, like, you know, I guess there's that question and answer kind of, okay, you see a KPI, and it's going in the wrong direction. You know, how do you write the ship? How do you work with them? That's a that's a great question. So I think the first thing to to set out is that first you really have to hire the right manager, right? Not everyone can manage your property. You know, a, a class A is probably not going to do well in, in C class, right? Total, mm -hmm. totally different tenant base, you know, responsibilities, things that things that you have to manage and vice versa. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, for us, you know, our cadence is more so on a quarterly basis for our property managers. Um you know, right now, I think, you know, for us, you know, they do a really good job with just communicating to us on a weekly basis. And so we don't necessarily need to at this time to talk on a, you know, a monthly or weekly basis. Um, but, you know, in the case of, you know, when things happen, and, you know, things start to shift off, you know, at that time, then we would actually sit down and have those conversations. And the best way that we actually do that is, going straight to the lead property manager, right? Uh, because a lot of times, you know, when you have, you know, let's say, um, you know, properties in, in different locations, sometimes, you know, that's actually addressed to, you know, maybe a regional property manager, right? And sometimes they, they can be focused on other properties that they may have on their accounts, you know, within their property management company. But just having that direct, you know, front end relationship with the actual owner itself, helps a lot, especially when, you know, we need to, you know, get back on track, whether it's delinquencies, setting a plan for that as well. Having a plan for every single delinquent tenant is extremely important, um, especially when you're dealing with, 
um, you know, let's say C-class properties, right? So for example, our rule is, you know, we don't let anyone go, you know, more than two months without, you know, having a plan for delinquencies, right? Uh, because a lot of times in the C-class, you know, let's say affordable product, you know, those tenants nine times out of 10 tend to work paycheck to paycheck, right? And so they can't afford to slip down three, four or five months, you know, we're not, we're probably not going to see that money ever again, right? right? So really tightening up on your systems, tightening up on your processes and having that, you know, close contact relationship with the property manager is extremely important in the asset management space as well. So that's kind of, um, you know, some context for our rhythm. Yeah. And it sounds like you, you rely a lot on reporting. You said you're getting like weekly communications. So are you working, do you work on the front end with the property manager to define you know, here's the report we want to see on a weekly basis. We want these KPIs on it. Or how does like, how does that come about? So you get that level of comfort. So you know, what's going on and you don't feel like you have to talk to them, you know, every day, yeah. every week. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. So, so back to the cadence. So the cadence for us is, you know, we get uh, weekly delinquency reports, uh, monthly uh, p &L reports. Um, and then we have our own internal turn turnover time reports because we handle the construction internally. Um, and I would say for, you know, that's essentially the most important reports that you really need to focus on, um, whether it's, you know, it's a P&L, your delinquencies and your turnover time for, you know, value add real estate, right? Mm -hmm. Because those three items are arguably the most important to actually execute in the business plan, right? Um, and so for us, it's really digging down into the, the P&L on a monthly basis. And then if we feel like we need to, then we'll start looking at, you know, work orders to figuring out, to try to figure out, hey, if we spend, we're spending, you know, let's say we're 10% over for this month, this month on r &M, for example, repairs mm -hmm. and maintenance, right? We want to dig into the work orders to figure out exactly what that is, because a lot of times you can start to see signs over time, or you can probably try to, you know, do some work or some preventive, preventative maintenance work to avoid having, you know, let's say a big plumbing issue or, you know, multiple instances of plumbing issues on your property as well. So I think I, I see, you know, from hearing, you know, in the real estate community, a lot of smaller operators struggle with dealing with or managing a lot of the reports as well, because it's so tedious, right? Mm -hmm. And we live in the business of doing deals, you know, that's how we get paid, right? It's by doing deals. And so um, I think, um, you know, on the smaller end, people start to struggle with the, you know, the reporting, but I think the way that you supplement that and, 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 and changing that in your business is by hiring, at least hiring those VAs to take some of those small tedious tasks off of your plate. So you still have someone paying attention to it, to it and, you know, flagging you when things happen, mm -hmm. but then also you're still, still able to grow your business as well. So that's something that we've been able to uh, implement. Yeah, really interesting. So tell me a little bit more about that. How, because I, I think you're right. I think that is a pain point for a lot of people. I mean, I, I've definitely felt that pain as, especially as we were getting started and you start to get more properties. And, you know, when you have a couple, you can look at all the reports. That's okay. When you start to get more, it become it becomes too much. It starts to take up all your time. So tell me how you've built leverage into that by bringing on VAs and, and talk to me a little about, about what those VAs are specifically doing for you guys. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. So we have um, a VA that's assigned to each specific, um, you know, uh, part of that asset management process, right? So someone that's responsible for I'm um, looking over the, the delinquencies, someone that's responsible for, um, you know, um, looking over the, you know, whether it's, there's a lot of collections and someone needs to go to court, right? There's somebody that needs, that needs to look over that as well. Um, someone that needs to look over the, the P&L to make sure that, hey, you know, when we print the report, you know, that comparison between, you know, budget versus actuals, you know, we don't want to see anything that's over 10%. You know, obviously, we're going mm -hmm. to see things that fluctuate, but sure. there really shouldn't be a 10% delta in a lot of those metrics, right? Um, but I think the, the key is, you know, for, for virtual assistants and just having a team is just everyone needs to understand their role and exactly what they're supposed to be looking at, right? Because if yeah. you have someone that is trained to have that eye, 
that takes out that takes off a lot of the small tedious you know tasks and and processes that really you know when you're trying to grow your business you don't really need to focus on unless you hit this threshold that requires you to actually pay energy and attention to it right mm -hmm. um so i think just having that proficient team and having someone that um or those folks who are trained on looking at certain items and exactly what to look for to help take some things off your plate but then also try to trying to put that property into um, autopilot as much mm -hmm. as possible is something that's extremely beneficial you know to us and you know would be beneficial to your audience as well when they're growing their real estate portfolio yeah i love how you've done that you've kind of defined defined the reports that they should be looking at and then within the reports you've defined kind of okay the these are the bands. Like if it's within this band, it's okay. I don't really need to know about it. It means we're on track. If it falls out of this band, that's something you need to bring to my attention. Right. And so, so then how are they say, say they're going through the P and they're seeing that, you know, stuff's out of whack. How are they then bringing that to your attention so that you, then, then you can act on that? Yeah. Yeah. Well, it's, it's just simple, simple communication. Um, just communicating and saying, Hey, you know, this is, above 10%, you know, hey, this is at 20%. And that requires, you know, that now at that time, we can now spend energy on figuring out exactly like, you know, okay, this, this plumbing is was an issue for this month, this went over by 20, 20%. Let's actually focus on this right here to figure out, hey, what's in the work orders that triggered this, this cost, right? Mm -hmm. um, is there something in due diligence that we have internal knowledge about, and the VA doesn't, to help us, you know, come to a conclusion as to what's going on on this property. Um, having those, you know, systems and levels of um, hierarchy is extremely important when, you know, budget, you know, just managing, you know, these properties and managing these reports as well um, for asset management success. Yeah, I like how you've done that. Is you, you're building scale into the business. It's going to allow you to continue to grow and focus on the right things. So just, um, Sticking to the these kind of less, lessons learned and and all this, when you think about, we talked about some of the things that, that have gone well. What's an example of something that you you maybe saw at the bigger firm that said, you know what, when I start my own business, that's not that's something that I want to do differently. Yeah, um, <clears throat> honestly, I think it's the the biggest thing I think that I've been able to you know, take from the firm, but then kind of tweak it to my liking is more so just that interaction with the property manager. Um, and for me, I am all about relationships. I am all about, you know, um, building that comfort between parties. Um, because I think, you know, you already know real estate is, is about relationships, right? Um, when someone likes you and when someone really enjoys working with you, you would be, I mean, it's just like sports, right? You have that teammate that, Hey, I'm going to like, I'm going to run through a brick wall for you. Right. <laughs> um, that is something that I pride myself on with all of my partners, with our, you know, vendors, our relationships, property managers is that, you know, building that relationship to whereas, you know, I can text them, you know, Tuesday at 10 PM and they respond. Right. Um, whereas, you know, in the institutional space, you know, at five o'clock it's, it's cut off, right? right? No one's working. Um, you'd be surprised as to what someone would do for you, you know, whether it's, you know, so for example, you know, we had, you know, a move in that, you know, a tenant was moving in and she had a bunch of mold on the property and, um, you know, she didn't feel comfortable with moving in, you know, our leasing rep told us, and we texted the property manager, you know, late. 11 p.m. Hey, we need someone to like come in tomorrow morning, bright and early to go out there and, you know, clean out the property because it has a mold on it from, you know, a roof leak or such and such. Right. Um, and just just having like that small impact with your relationship with your property manager translated into being able to have a happy tenant that didn't walk away from the lease. Right. Mm -hmm. When we just spent fifteen thousand dollars to turn it over. Right. Um, that immediately added value to our rent roll, right? So 
um, in the institutional space, that probably wouldn't have happened. You know, that that work order would have probably been pushed, you know, later on in that day. Mm -hmm. But I say that to say, just having those small relationships with people and understanding that real estate is all about people and we're in the people's business um, is really important when you're when you're scaling and trying to, um, you know, maximize your business and just, you know, having that relationship with your with your vendors. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I think you're exactly right. That it is, a, it is a relationship business in all aspects, right? And and you build those personal relationships and, and you get more out of people. And so I 100% hear what you're saying there. So Yannick, now that you're, you're on your own, you've been, um, you've launched Merlin acquisitions and correct me, I think you're, you're three months in, right? So you guys are, you guys are, are pretty fresh, but, but also well down the path. What is, what does the future hold for you and for Merlin acquisitions? Yeah. So for, for us, you know, we pride ourselves on providing, you know, real estate opportunities for professional athletes as well. Um, I think that uh, we live in a time where athletes are starting to change. You look at, you know, folks like LeBron James, right? The late, great Kobe Bryant, you know, the modern day athlete is starting to change from just playing football or, you know, dunking a basketball to now I'm a business professional, right? Now I'm in private equity. Now I'm, you know, a business owner. Mm -hmm. And so for us, we are definitely working on creating a fund that allows professional athletes to start putting their money to work. I think you've probably heard about the statistic, you know, 70 something percent of athletes go broke within three years after leaving mm -hmm. the NFL or NBA. Right. But I think that statistic is starting to turn around because there's a ton of education out there from social media, YouTube that are at the athlete uh, at the athletes fingertips to go out there and educate themselves on just basic financial knowledge. Right. And um specifically in the athlete space, a lot of times those guys do the same things what the other person does, mm -hmm. right? So mm -hmm. now that you have big time athletes like LeBron that, you know, is what we call, um, should be the standard, right? The standard athletes, everyone's trying to get to that level. We just heard that LeBron just became the first athlete billionaire, right? Now more and more athletes want to be like that. Right. Yep. So being able to provide education, being able to provide um, investment opportunities for those athletes as well, who have, you know, invested into our deals or who are interested in investing into our deals is something that we're really focused on um, driving and trying to get that traffic and just helping people um, grow their wealth. Yeah, that's awesome. I love that niche. And I think uh, with your background, I'm sure you guys have a ton of success. So Yannick, before I let you go, I want to take you through our keys to success round. There's four questions I want to ask you. The first one is, if you were going to invest in somebody else's deal, and you could only ask them one question, what would that one question be? If I was going to invest in someone else's deal, the, the first question that I would ask is, what is that person's character? All right, because in this business, nothing ever goes as planned, right? I've never had a deal that good went hundred percent as planned. Mm -hmm. And I want to make sure that I'm investing with someone who is a wartime general, someone who knows how to handle adversity, someone who knows how to get out when their backs are against the wall, because that is the person who is going to fight for protecting your capital. That is the person who's going to be a steward of your capital. That is a person who is going to um, nine times out of 10, figure out what they need to do to get to the other side, because it's, it's all good and, and sunny and roses when things go well, but a lot of times things happen and things go bad. And so for me, just being able to measure someone's character by how they respond to adversity is something I, you know, hold true and near and dear to my heart, you know? So that is something that you know, if, any, if someone is out there looking for passive real estate opportunities, that's the first thing that I would try to discover is, you know, who is this person that I'm investing with and what is their character? Yeah, I think that's a great answer. I mean, you know, real estate is all about solving problems, right? It's not when they're going to happen. It's not if they're going to happen. It's when they're going to happen. And, and you're right. It's all about how do you deal with the adversity? So I think that's a solid answer. What are you most proud of in your career? Um, I would say I'm most proud of 
and just my overall professional career was just making it to the NFL, right? Uh, less than 1% of athletes are able to even step foot on the field. Mm -hmm. um, and that's something that, you know, I hold, I'm very proud of being able to get to that level, you know, play at the highest level in my sport. Um, but for me, it's just being able to translate that same energy and focus and attention into the real estate space, but then also helping people as well. You know, that's one of the things that I've always um, been happy about with my, you know, professional athlete experience is just volunteering, you know, being of service to others. And so real estate is one of the things where you can do what I call a double bottom eye investment, right? And that's income and impact, right? So being able to help other people that are out there, provide them a quality, you know, nice, safe place to live is something that we we're proud of as well. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. And, and I'm glad you said that because I think that gets overlooked at times, but, but I truly believe that as well as we are making an impact. I mean, there, there's a lot of these properties that we're buying are, are run down and, and oftentimes not great places to live. And if you can fix them up and add safety and, and give a people a, pl a place to live that they're proud of, I think that impacts their entire lives. So yeah. I, absolutely. I, I think that's, uh, that's something to be proud of. What is a book that everybody should read? So one of my favorite books out there is the one thing by Gary Keller. Mm -hmm. And it's a book that essentially helped me a lot with my transition to being a full time real estate investor because there are a ton of things in our real estate business that we can do, right? It's asset management stuff, you know, managing construction, capital yep. raising acquisitions. There's a ton of stuff, right? There's always a, a just a never ending to do list. But for me, how I've been able to just digest um, my day on a daily day to day basis, but also make incremental uh, progress within my business is just focusing on that one thing in the in the book, one thing, the one thing by Gary Keller, really tells you, you know, what you should be focusing on at the end of the day, which is revenue creating opportunities, right? Mm -hmm. So the one thing by Gary Keller, that is probably one of my all time top 10 books. So nice. Yeah, it's a good one. Definitely a good one. And lastly, what is your number one key to success? My number one key to success, and I think this is probably a summation of just my overall career, how I got to where I am, where I am today. Um, you know, my backstory is I, you know, came to America when I was 10 years old from a place called Trinidad, third world country, right? Mm -hmm. um, you know, for me, I wasn't the strongest, fastest player, right? I walked on at a division one school. I earned my scholarship within a month. Um, you know, for me, I was placed at the bottom of the depth chart in the NFL. I rose my way up, you know, shortly before getting injured. You know, for me, it was um, not having a finance degree. Somehow I, you know, found a way to network and, and pull some strings and talk my way into a job in asset yeah. management, right? Um, and then now, hey, here we are, you know, we're raising capital and syndicating multifamily. So I think the the number one tool for success, you know, it doesn't matter where you start off, but if you're willing to do whatever it takes to hustle and grind and just put yourself in positions to be successful, I 100% agree that you will be successful. You just have to be willing to put in the work every single day and um, just never stop grinding. You know, and that's the mentality that I've been able to take into the real estate space. Yeah, I think you've got an awesome message about overcoming adversity multiple times in your life, right? And showing that through hard work, uh, you can achieve anything that you want to, right? You just have to be willing to commit to it, like you said. And so appreciate you sharing your message today, Yannick. And I think there's a lot we can learn from it. Appreciate you coming on the show and wish you the, the best and all your success. I'm sure you guys are going to be uh, high flying here in no time. So Thank you for coming on the show. Oh, before I let you go, if folks do want to learn more about what you're doing and learn more about Merlin Acquisitions, how do they reach out to you? Absolutely. So um, feel free to reach out to me via email. My email address is ycujo, C-U-D-J-O-E at Merlin, M-E-R-L-Y-N-N acquisitions.com. I'm always happy to have a 10, 15 minute phone call with anyone that's interested in real estate. And uh, also feel free to download our due diligence checklist, which is the one thing that you need to do 
to um, or the multiple things right on a checklist that you need to do to be successful in real estate, multifamily real estate due diligence. So, uh, Kent, it was a great time on the podcast and thanks so much for having me. Absolutely, Yannick. And hey, man, have a great rest of the day. Likewise. Thank you.